All right, good morning, good morning. Let's get our second component of our second day off the ground. We're gonna spend a few minutes now uh, getting an update on our different firefighter subgroups. Uh, so we've invited uh, four different speakers to be able to give um, uh, an update on uh, these individual subgroups. Um, so we're gonna start off with our fire investigators. So coming to the stage is our very own Dr. Gavin Horn. I see him coming all the way from the West Coast of the United States. Dr. Horn is the Director uh, of Research for United Laboratories Fire Safety Research Institute, the FSRI. Gavin's research interests range from firefighter health and safety and first responder technology development to materials testing and non-destructive evaluation. Prior to joining the FSRI team, he served as the director of IFSI's research program at the University of Illinois Fire Service Institute for 15 years, and as a firefighter engineer himself with the Savoy Fire Department. Gavin holds a doctorate in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, as well as a master's degree in fire protection engineering from the University of Maryland. Please join me in giving a, um, a warm welcome to Dr. Gavin Horn. All right, good morning. Thank you all for uh, sticking around towards the very end here. Uh, we've got a number of relatively quick presentations to go through here, and uh, I'd like to spend, I think, about 15 to 20 minutes, give or take, on uh, fire investigators. So as Jeff Polly mentioned, um, this is a group in the fire service that has not received as much attention in terms of, of research projects. Uh, relatively little investment in research to help support what are the risks that fire investigators face, and then importantly, what can we do to help to reduce some of those risks or some of those hazards that are in that environment. So this is a project that uh, we, we conducted as part of another series of studies that we had at, at the Fire Safety Research Institute. And you can find all this information here on a paper we published about a year and a half ago. In fact, if you'd like to download that, what I'll do over the next 15 minutes is really go through that paper. So you could check out this QR code uh, we paid for the uh, open access fees for it so you can grab it uh, and, and follow along if you're interested in that. And if you find this information useful, feel free to take that back, send it to any of your fire investigators or groups around there. There's another QR code on here that goes to our website that looks at various different aspects of fire investigation research, whether that is health and safety projects like this, but also looking at burn patterns and how they change with ventilation or with the different fuels that are involved to help fire investigators to be better at their craft. So we try to look at it from a, a holistic perspective. All right, so I'd like to start off uh, with going through this paper by uh, showing you a quick video. So this three and a half minute video here includes a little bit of the background information why we care about this. A lot of the work that Jeff Polly mentioned yesterday, and actually you'll see him in this video as well, as well as some of the methods and some of the scenes that we had our fire investigators look at in these scenarios. So, quick video here, hopefully this plays with sound here if I hit the button correctly. There we go. During a fire, everyone can see the hazard. They can see the flames, they can see the smoke. But what about after the fire? After the fire, it's not clear when it's safe to enter. Sadly, particulate hazards are also a big challenge for fire investigators or anyone working around a fire building after the fire. My name is Jeff Pauley. I'm the chairman of the Health and Safety Committee for the International Association of Arson Investigators. One of the big problems that exists today for fire investigators is cancer. The average fire investigator is at more fire scenes than the average firefighter for a longer period of time and sadly, oftentimes less well protected from the gases, the vapors, the particulates that persist in the post-fire environment. So our study is focusing on exposures that fire investigators may have while doing their job. Immediately after a fire, when an investigator may come in and look at the scene while it's still what might be called a hot B scene. So within a couple hours of after the fire has been suppressed. We're also interested in what happens afterwards when we have investigators that might come back one day later, 
three days later, or up to five days after the fire has been suppressed. There's different health and safety risks that might face our fire investigators. It's pretty common after a fire has been suppressed that we'll have 100 nanometer scale particulate that gets in the air. These are really important because they can get really deep into the airway and can cause known health concerns. We're gonna measure fibers that are in the air from the carpet as well as the fiberglass insulation that might come down during the firefight. These things are really interesting because we would expect them to be high immediately post fire suppression. But what happens multiple days afterwards when an investigator will come and dig out the scene? It may seem like there's no dust, there's no particulate in the air, but as soon as we disturb the scene in order to further investigate, that can get kicked back up into the air. We're also very interested in contaminant might be in the vapor phase or gas phase. Some very important uh, compounds such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and aldehydes are things that can be off-gassed by the fires. Particulate matter in the air can have a wide range of implications for all of those different health concerns. So we want to measure both the solid phase and the gas phase so we can have as much of an understanding of these different health impacts. And again, so we can help the fire investigators to understand how they can protect themselves. So we have a unique opportunity at the Fire Safety Research Institute to conduct full-scale fire testing. <clears throat> As you saw in those videos, uh, we were looking at a full-size structure, a 1,600 square foot home. You can see a picture here as well as a cross-section of that structure where we ignited fires from three different locations. We'll group them two different ways. One is a bedroom. You'll see bedroom four kind of in the lower middle part of that structure. But also we looked at common room fires, which included fires that started in the kitchen, spread into the living room area, or those that started in the living room and spread into the kitchen area. So very different size scenarios. And we were able to do nine replicates of each, where we knew exactly what fuels were in there. Now, again, this is a very challenging and expensive study to run. But we were able to attach it to a, a project that was funded from the Department of Homeland Security that was focused on ventilation tactics and search and rescue tactics for firefighters. And when that work got done, we went and did the investigation and it did some of this analysis. So in most cases, we were only able to look at the immediate post, what's called a hot B scene, an hour later. But in few cases, we were able to board up the structure and then come back three days later and five days later and see how things evolved. That's why I only see a few of those. Quick picture of some of the fuel loads you'll see in here. These are typical room and contents combustibles. Relatively light fuel load for what you might see in a typical home, right? This is certainly not a hoarder structure. There's a lot of some typical room and contents, but it's not a massive fuel load. While this is a step forward in terms of our understanding of what we might face in the environment, there's no way to replicate any site, any specific fire investigation scene that your investigators are going to go to. But this does help us to understand what are some of the risks and what are some of the few things we might want to look out for that we hadn't been paying attention to in the past. So before I start getting into the data, I want to talk about four specific time frames that uh, we think about that have actually been, been categorized by the International Association of Arson Investigators, or IAAI. And you'll see some of the data presented in each of these different time frames, depending on when we could actually collect some of that data. So when we talk about a hot scene A, that's as the fire has just been suppressed before the truckies get in there and start tearing things up, right? Those of you who have worked on a truck, you understand the joy in tearing walls down and dropping ceiling and all that sort of stuff. As an investigator, that makes things really, really hard. So we will often say, hey, hold on, home wreckers, before you get in and do your job, let us document the scene, let us take a look at what's going on, and that's what we call a hot A scene. There's also a hot B scene, which is the case where after suppression has been completed and after overhaul has been completed, up to two hours out. That's usually when the public investigators will get in there and will immediately take those documentation and do everything else that we can to, to try to understand what's going on in the scene. There are often cases I mentioned will then board things up and then come back, whether it be the private investigators coming back, working for insurance companies or for some uh, other groups, or the, the public investigators themselves. And those are broken down into what's called a warm scene, so up to three days later. And then sometimes it's been called even a cold scene. So after three days later, and what's really important here is where they're not generating detectable or visible dust, fumes, particles, mist, particulates, gases, vapors, or aerosols. It's really important that the detectable or visible, because 
Many of these particulate, if you've seen throughout, are so small you cannot detect them with the naked eye. And what we're actually detecting with our four gas monitors in the fire service are typically not what we're particularly interested here in terms of those contaminants. So you can get a good idea of what's hydrogen cyanide or carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide in the air, but those of you who have an asbestos meter, please let me know about it because I don't know of one that exists or that can get a good measurement of a handheld monitor for PAHs or VOCs are very challenging. So these are the different time frames in which we've taken a look at some of the data. And I apologize, the next few slides are going to be very full of data. A lot of tables, a lot of charts. I'll try to help get through this so it's somewhat understandable. But these are the tables that come directly from that paper if you're looking at it on, online. So the first series of data that we're presenting are particulate. And you'll see here in this table on the left-hand side, you've got different size of particulate, PM1, 2.5, PM10, and then there's also respirable and, and total particulate. Basically, when you go from the top to the bottom of that table, it goes from the smallest size of particulate, so PM1, those less than one micron, so on the order of about 100 nanometers. Those are the ones that, again, can get very deep into the lungs and can then deposit farther into the body. And you work your way down there to the total amount of particulate that's in the air. We looked at this both in terms of total, so there's 18 different fires that we looked at, both pre and in the hot scene B time frame. And we can break that down into nine different cases where we looked at both the bedroom and the common room scenarios. So to give you an idea about particulate, I think every uh, presentation that has looked at particulate also includes a picture of a human hair. It's the most understandable way to think about particulate. So you pluck out one of your hairs and you look at the end of it. The diameter of a typical human hair is somewhere between 50 and 70 microns. Rough numbers. When we're looking at PM10, that means that you can line up between five and seven of these particles across the diameter of your hair. If you look at PM2.5, then you can line up four of those little particulates within each of those. So you can see how difficult these are to detect, particularly with the naked eye, which is what we often rely on in the fire service. There's also different ways that we can think about the air quality. And you have probably heard of the air quality index as something that's become very commonly discussed in this day and age, particularly thinking about wildland fires and the smoke and how that changes the air quality. But there's different categories of the air quality ranging from good to moderate to unhealthy to very unhealthy. And there's a lot of different things that can go into those calculations, some based on ozone, but others are based on particulate. So just really quickly want to share with you, just focus here on the PM2.5. And if you see on the far right, based on the concentration within the air, you can see what level of air quality you might have. So if we look at the total firefighter, or the, the total scenarios, we had a uh, average concentration or median concentration of 21 micrograms per cubic meter. That sits in the moderate air quality area, but immediately post-fire in this, this hot scene B, it was 103.5, which sits in the unhealthy category. If we focus on those that were just in the common room scenario, 191, that's well into the very unhealthy areas. And this is averaged over one hour, right? So the AQI typically thinks about an entire day but we have this over one hour, so we need to take that, that interpretation with a little bit of care. But I also want to think about we're able to collect this data every second. So this monitor collects those concentrations every second, and there were certain times where we had that air quality, and so the common room, the median value of the peaks was over 1,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So incredibly high concentrations, oftentimes for very short periods of time. Reinforcing, again, why we need to have respiratory protection for our firefighters, particularly in the hot scene B scenario. And what was even particularly more interesting for us <clears throat> is when we start looking at days out. Now, on the horizontal axis here, we have this in hours. So you can see at about 25 hours post, that's roughly a day after. 75 is roughly three days after, and again, close to five days out. And what you can see when we look at this average respiratory particulate, it stays right about the same level as before. And also, on the horizontal axis, now we're looking at micrograms per cubic meter as opposed to milligrams. Sorry, we're looking at milligrams now instead of micrograms on the previous one. So you see there's not a whole lot of change in those first few days. But all of a sudden, we see these big spikes when we get to the three days and five days. This didn't have anything to do with all of a sudden being a lot more particulate in the air. What happened actually in the orange data line there, common room experiment six, we had some of the ceiling came down during the investigation. 
And on the fifth day, we actually tore that down because oftentimes investigators will have to look at utilities behind the walls and see if they created some of the risk. So this increase in particulate is based on what we were doing during the investigation. So even five days later, depending on what you're doing, when you're starting to pull some drywall off and doing a lot of heavy shoveling, those sorts of things are gonna kick up that particulate and raise it to incredibly high levels. In fact, when we're doing this, even wearing a N95 or a dust mask would not provide enough protection for what we might like to have. So when you're having your investigators do this removal of drywall, we need to consider maybe temporarily they should be going back to an SCBA, but we certainly need to understand that respiratory protection is important when we're doing some of these tasks that are gonna upset the scene and are gonna create some of this particulate, even if it looks initially like there's nothing in the air, we can do things during the job that can lift that back up into the air and has a lot of implications for human health. As I said, some of those really small particulate can penetrate and deposit into deep into the respiratory system. And we didn't look at what was on this particulate, but it's expected that we would likely have some hydrocarbon molecules and a variety of toxicants that can get delivered then into the lungs. We know that both in the general population as well as in fire service populations, this increase in particulate can have important implications for cardiovascular events as well. So there's a lot of implications beyond the potential for delivering these toxicants into the body. Also mentioned we looked at the gas phase and a whole bunch of different compounds. I won't get, have nearly enough time to speak about all of those, but I want to focus on our benzene and naphthalene. So these are two compounds that we see are some of the most prevalent when we do analysis of airborne compounds in fire environments. Benzene typically is the highest concentration of the VOCs, particularly the B-Texas compounds, and naphthalene oftentimes more than an order of magnitude higher than we see of other PAHs. And we see that we have a dramatic increase from pre to the hot scene A, and in many cases even remain elevated in hot scene B. The good news is, these are several orders of magnitude lower than what we see during the firefight themselves. And actually oftentimes lower than the short-term exposure limits, those are the 15-minute occupational exposure limits, around the order of a recommended exposure limit, which is typically an eight-hour. So we need to be aware of these things, we need to be careful, and hopefully we can keep track and, and monitor these volatile organic compounds. But we see that also they tend to kind of decay away over time. They're volatile, they tend to evaporate and move out into the world. So we have concerns of those VOCs and these pHs in the world in particular, but they're not as significant of a concern as we have during the firefight themselves, much, much lower concentrations. We still wanna protect our fire investigators from them. But we found a different behavior when we looked at some of these other compounds, aldehydes. The highest overall concentrations were for acetaldehyde, but the highest relative to their exposure limits was actually formaldehyde, also a group one known carcinogen. And you can see here, we see a dramatic increase in the formaldehyde over an order of magnitude increase for the hot scene A to a median value of 356 micrograms per cubic meter. Short-term exposure limits are 125 micrograms per cubic meter. We don't often think about formaldehyde in terms of the protection for our fighters, firefighters or for monitoring formaldehyde. Furthermore, when we take a look at what happens in multiple days out, as I said, we would go in and board these structures up. Then we go in and do the investigations one, three, and five days later. We'd take the board off of the front door, but we wouldn't take the boards off of the rest. So anything that had off-gassed and built up inside that structure, you can see one day out, in both cases where we had the bedroom experiments, the formaldehyde in there had increased beyond that short-term exposure limit averaged over one hour. In fact, it remained elevated even three days post-fire investigation. So this information, Jeff and his crew took it back to the IAAI Health and Safety Committee and changed some of the recommendations for us to start thinking about monitoring for formaldehyde as well as providing respiratory protection because some of the cartridges that you might typically use in a, res in, in a uh, cartridge-based respirator will not protect you from formaldehyde, but others will. So take-home messages helped us to understand how we could protect our fire investigators. So this is basically, uh, again, a Cliff Notes version of what we had discussed or what we, we discovered. But the key take home messages are that the elevated levels of airborne particulate can be encountered in any phase of the fire investigation. Five days out, and I would assume if we kept going beyond there, if we would shovel and we'd take down drywall, we could continue to kick up some very high levels of particulate in the uh, post-phase investigation scene. 
particularly when we were shoveling and we were removing drywall. So it reinforces the need to protect the fire investigator's airway from the particulate. And particularly while you're dropping ceiling, maybe even moving back into that SCBA for a short period of time where you might not have enough protection even from a, a cartridge respirator. We also saw that the airborne concentrations of aldehydes were in many cases in the scenes that we looked at higher than many of the other volatile organic compounds that we typically think about, which is oftentimes that benzene. The benzene and naphthalene were there. They're always reported at the highest concentrations in the studies we've done in the past where we have live fire responses, but formaldehyde stayed at least into the hot scene A. So the recommendations are to provide protection, respiratory protection for formaldehyde at least through the warm scene investigations. And that is possible in some cases with cartridge respirators. We also suggested now we need to think about carrying monitors to detect formaldehyde throughout the investigation scene. One of the challenges is sometimes formaldehyde monitors, there's not a great technology that exists out there. You can get a module that goes into your six gas meter, your four gas meter that will detect formaldehyde, but Right now, there's a lot of improvements that are necessary in monitoring that firefighters can carry and fire investigators can carry with them. So thank you very much. I think I came in just under 20 minutes. I might have a minute or two for questions if there's any out there. If not, feel free to check out the QR code for this manuscript, download it, distribute it freely. And uh, any questions you might, be ha might have, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, Sir. Quick question. In some of the slides you showed, there's a huge difference or discrepancy between uh, one scene versus the other. They are right next to each other. One of them is almost like pre-fire levels, and the other one is like maybe 10 times higher. Can you account for the differences a little bit? Yeah, yeah great question and keen eye there. So part of it has to do with the size of the different rooms as well as the ventilation in some of those rooms. So the bedroom was right next to the, uh, the, the common room itself, but typically much smaller fires because it was confined larger to that space. And also there was a very large window in that bedroom that provided a fair bit of ventilation to move through and to move past where the investigation was ongoing. So I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but providing ventilation can be very important in terms of helping to uh, get some of the particulate out, but also a lot of those vapors that build up. So that's why you often saw a lower concentration in the bedroom scenarios than we did in the, the larger fires uh, that were not as well ventilated uh, in, in the common room. So great question. I've got a question. Um, yes, sir. Yes, if you look at the burning, uh, what kind of did you monitor fire condition? What did you have in different bedrooms? Because if you're setting fire in one room, you might have well ventilated, which kind of indicates presence of formaldehyde and acrolein. But if you go for the other room, it's completely different fun ventilation. And then if you're adding fuel, uh, I could see from your pictures it's different. And if you've got any halogens, that's changing completely chemistry for the particulate matter and soot concentration. So how did you? included that? Yes, great question. So in the paper, all of the different fuels that were included in there, are there in the supplementary materials because it's far too large to include, but we had, we've documented it was the exact same fuels in all of the uh, bedroom fires had the exact same fuels and all of the kitchen fires included the exact same fuels. And you're right, the difference in the fuels will make an impact, but also the differences in the firefighting activities will have a very large impact on, on all of these things because some of them we had firefighters that, that vented the structure and then delayed before they put water on and we had very different fire responses from there and vice versa. So we didn't control that. This was an observational study. We didn't control that because that was part of another study that we were just documenting the scenes beyond there. But you're absolutely correct. We had different materials in there, but we also, all of these materials, we burnt that same couch at this point probably 500 times, and we have in our materials database all of the information about the burning characteristics of all the fuels that are, are used in there. But we did not in this paper connect the two as you're discussing there. Actually a great thing to, to be done in the future. And just the, the last comment, when you're talking about formaldehyde, did you look at acrolein because they are interacting together and acrolein is much worse toxicant? Yes, we did. And uh, we did not have nearly as high of concentrations as acrolein, who had actually below the uh, short-term exposure limits. But that was in the panel of, of aldehydes that we looked at. Thank you. Great questions. Okay, last one. Okay. Um, did you do any observations for cyanide or metals because of like the uh, metals that are used in pressure treating lumber. 
Yes, uh, we did for the cyanide. Yes, we have. Uh, we were monitoring that throughout the scenarios. Uh, it was not included in these presentations. We didn't actually measure for my, for uh, metals in this case. Uh, relatively small amounts of metals that we we saw. Actually, that's not true. We did monitor, but we didn't have a whole lot. And a lot of that has to do with the fuel load. And I think to go back to the previous question, if we would have had other fuels in there, we're doing a lot of tests now with uh, e-scooters, and we're finding a whole lot more metals that are in the air. But from the, the, the fuels that we had, we had very, very low metals that, that were released. Thank you. Great question. All right. Thank you. Thank you.